they didn't take everything. They took some. I just ended up getting stabbed a few times. I had the knife on my throat. Um, yeah. I thought I was gone. I thought I was going to die, do you know what I mean? My name is Glody Wabello. I'm from Congo, Kinshasa, born, raised in London, South East, Lewisham. I came to this country with my mum, my older sister. Um, I remember the first time when I got on the plane as a little boy and the hostess gave us like hand wipes after our food. <laughs> and I remember thinking, it smelled so good. I thought it was a sweet, I was about to eat it. That's how fresh I was, I guess. Congo boy coming to London. But I never went to school in Congo at all. I didn't have any form of education, no nursery, um, no daycare, nothing. So coming to England for me was very different. Um, I remember my first Christmas here and it was snowing and it was so bizarre because I've never seen anything like that before ever in my life. Um, but at the same time as a kid I was excited to play outside in the snow. But um, yeah, like seeing different types of people that I've never seen before, for me it was it was confusing. Um, people spoke a language that I didn't understand. I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of what people were saying. I felt safe at home. I felt safe indoors. I started primary school in, I think year one, primary school. I couldn't speak any English, my mum couldn't speak any English, and my sister couldn't speak any English. My dad already lived here, but his English wasn't that great either. Um, going to school, primary school, was extremely challenging for me because I was born cross-eyed and I was fresh and my hair was patchy and my hair was picky and I was dark skinned and I stood out and people made fun of me and I quickly learned that I was the laughing stock in the class. Um, people used to point at me and laugh, push me and laugh. And I, I, I didn't understand what people were saying, but I could somehow read body language. And I used to go home and tell my mom that like, I don't want to go to school because I didn't have any friends. Um, the teachers were welcoming, but that was about it. And I remember one day someone was making fun of me about my eyes so much that I just got angry and ended up fighting. And that's when it all began really. Next day I was fighting again and then fighting in primary school became the norm for me to defend myself, to stand up for myself. Um, I didn't really know how else to challenge anyone because People were saying things to me I didn't understand, so my, my reaction straight away was, let's just fight. And that's, that's how I made friends, essentially, it's, it's weird. I started fighting, the more I started fighting, the less people started making fun of me. The more friends I made, the more people started to understand that I'm not just going to give in and let them literally made me the laughing stock of the school. Um, I wasn't I wasn't this, I wasn't smart at all in school to be honest with you. I was in like extra lessons, I was in I had a mental, um, I was a, I was in the lowest class in maths, 
I was in the, I was in the lowest class in English, lowest class in science. Um, so school was challenging for me academically, but I don't know. I just didn't understand. As a young boy, I didn't understand school. I didn't understand why I had to be there. Because for me, I, it, was, it, it wasn't fun coming to this place to get bullied, to go home where my parents don't even understand what's going on because in Congo, I didn't experience bullying amongst my friends or people didn't take, take the piss out of me in school. So me going home, tell my parents, oh, this is happening in school. For them, it was like, just go to school because they, they didn't understand bullying, do you know what I mean? But I did finish primary school um, year five got better for me, I guess. I made a lot more friends. I got used to the boys on the estate that we lived in, Forest Hill, South East London, um, Tyson Road is where I grew up. So I made my friends were the ones that lived on the estate and I felt comfortable there because in a way they 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 really knew that how I was in primary school um fighting they respected me for like having my own back they respected me for not letting even the older people take the piss out of me so that's how I got involved in like groups of people, extra associations. Um, I started feeling safe on my estate because the boys really looked out for me. They started um, giving me things like clothes, trainers. I mean, my family wasn't rich at all. Um, my dad was the only bread earner at the house. I hardly saw him, he literally worked all day, all night. When he comes home, I'm sleeping, get for school. When I leave for school, he's sleeping. So we, we never really saw each other unless it was like a Sunday or something. At what stage then, uh, Glow, did you get involved at Counting Lions and how did that begin? Um, I started selling drugs when I was about 13. Started selling weed for the older guys. Um, they used to give me like five bags of weed and if I saw all five then I keep 20 pounds for myself which for me was good money at 13 do you know what I mean 20 pound the more I sell the more I make so I used to ride around on pedal bikes with my friends um, at the time so for me, it was like playing out really and, 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 and earning money. And then I started smoking weed. I got into smoking weed with the older guys. Um, I remember actually one time I didn't know, I didn't know how to roll up um, cannabis. So my friend rolled one up for me and he put it in my pocket, jack my jacket pocket, and I went home with it. <laughs> I don't know why I went home with it, but yeah. My friend rang me when I was at home and he was like, oh, I left that thing in your jacket pocket. And I was like, oh, did you? Because I, I didn't even remember. But I don't know what came over me. Like, I start, I, 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 I lit it, I sparked it in, in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mum was next door, my sisters were sleeping, it was about 10 o'clock at night, um, smoking this weed in my bedroom, not even realising how strong it's going to smell, like, it didn't even cross my mind, like, this is going to smell a lot, I mean, so I'm smoking weed in my room, and then... There was no panic at all until I heard my mum moving <laughs> next door. I heard a foot shuffling. I remember a foot shuffling in her bedroom and I'm thinking, 
oh, maybe she's just going to the toilet, but her, she's got to walk past my bedroom to get to the toilet. But I'm so naive about how strong this thing smells. I'm just thinking she's going to go to the toilet, come back, and, um, yeah, it didn't happen like that. Um, she knocked on my door. She said, what's that smell? I threw it out the window and jumped in my bed and pretended like I was sleeping. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, she opened the door and my home room was just smoked out. I don't know, I don't know what, I, what was going through my head. She went crazy, man. Like, she she. She, she went crazy. Obviously, after all like, the bad reports from school of me fighting and, and um, the low grades from school, um, I, think, I, think, I think she just had enough, or they had enough, and I got kicked out um, probably like 14, 13, turning 14. I can't really remember the exact age, but I got kicked out. Um, being homeless for me at a, at a young age was extremely challenging because it's like I can't call my friends and be like, yo, bro, I'm homeless. Let me let me sleep at your house because it's not their house. <laughs> it's their parents' house. Do you know what I mean? And it's like now they've got to explain to their parents why I've got to stay at their house. And it was just... It wasn't as easy as that, so there was a lot of nights, a lot of days where I slept outside, slept on the estate. It's funny because I used to sleep on the estate and a lot of the guys didn't even know that I was homeless because they'll just see me in the daytime. And then everyone be like, all right, I'm going home in a bit, see you later. I'll be like, yeah, in a bit, I'm going home, but I'm not even, they don't know that I'm, I'm not going home. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I pretend like I'm going home, but I, I just find the, the safest estate to sleep in, like the warmest, the most um, closed, like whatever. Sometimes I get on a bus and um, I think it's the 176 or something. If anyone's from South London, they know the 176. Um, goes through like Forest or all the way to like central London and back. I think it's a 24 hour bus. It was at the time anyway. And um, I used to get on that bus just to sleep on it, to get to the last stop, to cross the road and sleep on it on the way back, to do the same thing on the other side till daytime. And then I'll just go back, see what guys are around. And that, that was my life for a bit. Sofa surfing. I've done it all and that's when my life changed really after that. Um, I met a friend and I opened up to him and I said to him, I'm homeless and I've got nowhere to live and, and, and nowhere to sleep, um, no food. I was wearing the same clothes really um and he said he, he might be able to help me um he introduced me to someone else like an older guy and the older guy had a, his own place had a flat and he said yeah i could i could live here um but i have to pay rent i mean at the time i think the rent was like 50 pound a week or something now, I've, as a 14-year-old boy, um, I was thinking, how on earth am I going to get £50 every week to keep a roof over my head? Do you know what I mean? I, I raised the question, I asked him, how, how am I going to pay you £50 every week? And he said, um, he's going to introduce me to someone else that's going to help me make money so then I can have a roof over my head and make money and I thought, this is, this is, this is brilliant. This is all my, my, my dreams answered. Like, it's crazy, I was so thankful. I remember I was like, literally like, thank you, like, you've, you've helped me so much. I was so thankful to my friend um, who, who introduced me to him. 
Claudia, so what, what was your life like when you, when you said yes to this and living in, in his spot? It was brilliant, <laughs> to be honest with you. I thought, as a kid, I thought, this is sick, that, like, because I'm bringing all my friends around. Um, I'm thinking, oh, I don't live at my mum's. I felt cool, like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I live by myself, independency. Um, but it didn't happen like that. Um, I, I got introduced to the guy that was gonna was gonna help me make money, and that's how I got involved in a world that I knew nothing about. I I started selling. Well, I went to Hastings. Now. Going to Hastings as a 14-year-old boy, for me, it was very... I had butterflies in my stomach because I've never been there before. Why are you going Hastings? Um, that's a good question because at first I didn't, I didn't know the answer to that. I didn't know why I was going there. Do you know what I mean? And when I went there, that's when I learned this is, this is, this is, this is where my job's based, basically. And my job role was selling Class A drugs, which I didn't even know that term, Class A drugs. I didn't know that meaning. I didn't know what Class A drugs was. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't, I didn't know the difference of the two. Do you know what I mean? Coming from selling weed, I mean, apart from hash, all weed looks the same, right? Weed is weed, herb, leafy. Do you know what I mean? So I got taken to Hastings and I got introduced to Class A drugs. I got shown everything from what the drug was, how to conceal it, how to wrap it, how to um, distribute it, the difference in the two, the white and the brown, and you was 14? Yeah, I was 14. Um, I remember my parents, my, 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 dad, my dad used to call my phone. But as a kid, I'm still, I'm, in my head, I'm still um, thinking I'm getting in trouble for the weed I was smoking at home. Do you know what I mean? So I'm trying to escape that. <laughs> I don't want to answer to that. So, um, I found out that he 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 used, he reported me missing because the police rang my phone, and um, I remember one time I was in Hastings and I was looking out the window and, and my phone rang it was it was on withheld, and I answered it and I said hello. I can't remember the officer's name now, but it said PC, whatever from Lewisham Police Station. Um, we're calling because your dad's reported you missing. And if you tell us you're all right, we'll just leave you, leave you, do what you're doing or whatever. We won't come looking for you. That was his exact words. And I said to him, yeah, I'm fine. And he said, all right, thank you, bye. And that's, that was it. Never, um, I got that phone call a few times, not once, but it, it was all the same. It was literally like, the dad's reported you missing. Let us know you're all right, and we'll just tell him that you're all right. And, and that was it. Um, I thought that was normal, though, innit? I, I, as I was thinking, I thought, yeah, that's normal. That's, that's their procedure. I thought that's, what they, that's, that's how it works. Um, at the time, I was actively selling drugs. Um, so, Claude, tell me what your, a, a daily day would have been in your life in Hastings as a 14-year-old boy. My daily life was like... Um, depends, where, depends where I'm staying. Sometimes I stay at, like, drug user's house. Sometimes I stay in a, in a, in a house of my own. Um, so tell me what it would be like if you were spending a, a, a day in the drug user's house. What would a day like in that, in that be like? A day in the drug user's house as a 14-year-old kid is 
very nerve wracking because the pressure from the, the, the people above me is don't get robbed, don't lose the drugs, stand firm, make sure you have a weapon. Do you know what I mean? And and that's that's when I start experiencing paranoia and 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 being on my guard. Do you know what I mean? So there's not really any sleep. You're not really getting any sleep. You gotta sleep like one one eye open, as they say. Do you know what I mean? Because they don't know me. I could get robbed. They're adult compared to me. Do you know what I mean? So And Glow, how much was you making a day at the moment? A day or a week? Me personally, I was getting paid about five to six hundred pounds a week. Um, well, I say I was getting paid, I was supposed to be getting paid five to six hundred pounds a week, but something always happens. It never like, it never goes that smoothly. Like, do you know what I mean? Um, either the drug takes too long to sell or somehow, some way, something's missing and it deducts out of my money because ultimately I'm the one responsible for the drugs and the money. So if something doesn't add up or calculate, right, it, it comes off my wage. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, got, I got paid, but it wasn't, it wasn't five, six hundred pound every week that I was expecting. Do you know what I mean? And Glock, what would you say was your worst experience at, at that time while using Hastings? Or the worst memory? The worst memory? I've got a few worst memories. Um, I'll just pick one. So I was, I was in a house, right? And the way we, the way we used to operate was like, um, was in a high rise building, top floor. Um, someone downstairs. No, I get a phone call first of all that someone's coming to purchase the drugs, and then they would um, be downstairs. But I meet them. I let them into their state, but they won't know exactly what floor I'm on. So then they'll enter their state. And then I'll meet them on like a random floor. So they won't actually know where I am, right? But one day, um, someone knocked on the door. And that's bizarre, right? Because no one's meant to knock on the door. Like, no one's meant to know what door I'm in. Someone knocked on the door. I rang my boss, I said, someone's knocking on the door, what's going on? He said, um, have a look through the people. I looked through, I recognised the drug user. Um, so I rang back my boss, I said, yeah, I recognise the user and recognise who they are. And my boss was like, oh yeah, they called, they wanted something anyway, but just deal with them, innit? They're here, just deal with them. So I've opened the door and there was actually two of them. There was one hiding around the corner. So as I've opened the door, immediately they just barged in. At first he was like just talking nonsense, talking about where he was saying someone's name, where, where are they? But I feel like that now, now I know that was definitely like um, a tactic to just get into the house or distract me or whatever. But they're talking about where's some female's name, I was, I was like, what are you talking about? I don't know who you're talking about, what female, do you know what I mean? And then as I'm talking, one of them literally, <laughs> you won't even understand this, you'll probably think, is this even possible? But do you know like a beer can? A, a, like, let's say, I don't drink, but um, let's say like a large Stella can or something like that, but it's been converted into like, is, ripped it so you rip the inside out and you convert it into that um that zigzag blades kind of thing do you know what i mean i can't really explain it yeah. a bit like barbed wires do you know what i mean if you get a stellar can strip it down and whatever you can actually make it look like um barbed wires do you know what i mean so they pulled that out and um 
they attempted to rob me. I got attacked, and 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 the rest, the rest, yeah. Next question. <laughs> and how how did that come to an end? Like this, that time in Hastings, how did that end? Um, I used to get like stopped and searched by the police. Um, they used to pull pull, pull over in bully vans, the the big police vehicles, and. They literally just used to throw me in the back of their van, take me to like public toilets, strip search me, um, like they'll clear the cubicles, get everyone out of the toilet, strip search me and let me go. Obviously, I uh, I didn't know at the time that they couldn't do that. That's wrong. Do you know what I mean? So at the time, I, I just thought, it was like a game we used to play, in it. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? They stopped me, strip search me, let me go. Um, until the next time, and um, but the last time they raided a house that I was in, kicked in the door. Um, it was a drug user's house. Um, I think at this time I was about fifteen, turning fifteen, something. Um, they raided the house, kicked it in. I got arrested for class A drugs. Um, P wits possession with intent to supply, um, class A and money laundering, and um, that was it. I got bail, um, obviously, my boss wasn't happy that I lost all of that stuff. I think it accumulated to that, maybe even just under £4,000, all the drugs and money um, that the police took. So, um, I actually went back there on bail. I remember I went back there on bail because my boss, he said, I need to make back for that loss. Do you know what I mean? And, um, I can't remember who bailed me out because my parents didn't know that I got arrested. I think my friend bailed me out, like one of the older guys. They got me out of the police station. The police didn't contact my parents to tell them that I'd been arrested. It's like no one, no one really cared. Do you know what I mean? I was just like in, in, in through the system one way and then just came out. And then um, I didn't really know the severity of like my arrest. Do you know what I mean? I didn't really, because I didn't know like class A drugs was a serious drug or like, do you know what I mean? I just thought it was the same as just selling weed, but just a different type of drug. But um, yeah, I quickly found out that it was it was serious because I got given f three years. Um, when I was 16, I got given three years. I went to um, cook and wood, young offenders. I um, went cook and wood, young offenders. I went Ashfield, young offenders. Um, Portland, young offenders. Feltham, young offenders. Um, that was my life until I was 18. Um, just touring different prisons. And then when you came out, Glow, then what was next as 18? So I came out of prison, um, 18, turning 19. I turned 19 the year I came out. Um, obviously, for me, it was... I thought I was going to come out and things were going to be normal, but you don't realise that the time the times changed. I mean, that, that period of as a young... As a young man, um, a lot hasn't changed in older people's life. But as a young man, it's like all my friends are now like in college or some are even working now. And I've just come out of prison. Do you know what I mean? So it's one of those things where I felt left out. Do you know what I mean? I felt like I missed a lot. I was the odd one out. Um, 
socially, I, I didn't really know how to um, talk to people or like that. And um, before I went custody, I was homeless as well. So coming out of custody, um, I didn't get support for housing. Um, social services wasn't involved. Um, I was forced to go back to my parents. And that was the most hardest and most awkward thing I had to do in my life because I left the house as a young man, young boy, should I say. And within that period, I've been arrested, I've gone to prison, and now I'm coming out as an adult in the, law, in, in, in the eyes of the law. And my family don't know who I am anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's like, they don't understand what I've been through. They don't understand. All they know is that I was smoking weed, I left home, and now I've just come out of prison. Like, literally. <laughs> so connecting back with my family was so hard because I didn't know how to. Do you know what I mean? And... Um, Hello, what was that first day like when you, when you did go back? Obviously, it was awkward because my dad obviously took me in to sleep on the sofa. My mum was obviously angry. She wasn't talking to me. Um, and I thought, you know what? Let me try and like prove that I can be better. Do you know what I mean? Like prove that I can be, like I can be, um, I can be a good son, if you like. Do you know what I mean? So I actually applied for college. Um, I applied for motor mechanics, Bromley College. And going into college, from someone that's just been through the Young Offenders Institution and now you're sitting in college as 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 a 18 year old person, it was so hard for me to adjust to normal education. Do you know what I mean? Because my, my education wasn't before custody, it wasn't like the best anyway. Do you know what I mean? I was I had low grades anyway. I wasn't the star pupil in school. So for me, Going to college was like a lot to take in. It was it was overwhelming. But I wasn't doing it for me, I was doing it for my mum. Do you know what I mean? Because I thought I need to get in my mum's good books and I need to um show her that I can change. Um yeah, I went to college for like eight weeks. Literally eight weeks. What did you decide to do instead? So one day I came out of the shop in my local area um, and I see this white car pull up next to me and they called my name with excitement. Like, oh, sh yo, I was thinking, who's that? Obviously, I'm thinking, wow, this car's sick. Right? <laughs> I'm thinking, who's that in this car? Like, yeah. I looked in the car. I realised that it was the guy that I was work, working for in um, Hastings, right? But it's like, at first I was nervous. So I was thinking, mm, I, didn't, I didn't really know, like, is, is me and him cool? Because I still owe him money, right? But in my head, I was thinking, surely he's rid off that debt because I've done the time, like, I went guilty, I just... You know what I'm saying? I, I, I went into it head first and took, took responsibility. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah, I got in the car and asked me what you've been up to. I was just telling me yeah, I've just come out not long ago, applied for college. College ain't going well. Um, we went to get something to eat. <clears throat> and then, yeah, it was just like, Oh, you know you still owe me that money, kind of thing. And how did you feel at that point when you said that? Like, I'm real in it. Like, so I was thinking, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm just real in it. I'm under like it's true in it. I was thinking, yeah, you're right. I do still owe you that money because, as far as I was concerned, I lost your things. Do you know what I mean? So. 
Like, I, I come from a place where if you owe someone something, you pay them, right? So I was just like honest with him. I was like, yeah, I know, but like, I don't have any money right now. Like, they took everything. Um, any money I did have, I had to survive in prison. Do you know what I mean? Sitting in prison isn't free at all, especially when you don't have family support and you got to support yourself. Um, so any money I did have, I, I, I had to su survive in prison. So I, I came out with hardly any money or probably not any money. Do you know what I mean? But, but he was calm. He was just like, no, it's calm, bro. Like, no pressure. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Don't worry. Like, he was like, I might have a job for you in it that'll just help you pay off the money you owe me and help you earn money. And it's like low risk. Do you know what I mean? You're not, you're not going to be doing what you was doing in Portsmouth, on the streets, out here, doing hand-to-hands and that. So I was thinking, yeah, like, this is, this is sick. Like, do you know what I mean? So what was that job? Um, how, he, how he sold it to me was, you literally just got to answer this phone. Like, you literally just got to answer the phone and direct the people where to go, who to meet. Do you know what I mean? I thought the phone was still in Hastings, but he was like, no, I'm in Portsmouth now. I'm not in Hastings no more. I'm in Portsmouth now. Um, and he was like, yeah, Portsmouth is much better. It's not as rough. Like, remember, I got robbed um, in Hastings and that. So it was like, yeah, none of that. It's not like that kind of environment, whatever. So um, I don't know. I felt like he, he gave me an offer I couldn't refuse, really, especially someone you owe money to. I felt like he was giving me another chance. Do you know what I mean? Another chance to like better myself and to rectify what like where I went wrong. Do you know what I mean? So I thought it was a good deal. I thought, he said he's going to give me £900 a week to answer this phone, to literally not go anywhere. And I thought, this is brilliant. Like, do you know what I mean? I don't have to go anywhere to answer the phone. So, yeah, I took the deal. And how did that work out? Um, at, at first, it was calm. Like, it was literally just that. Do you know what I mean? Answer the phone. I was answering the phone, answering the phone, things was going well. And then, yeah, something happened where the people that was working for him couldn't work or something like that. And he called me and he basically said, yo, the phone needs to stay on. You might, I might have to go and sell the drugs temporarily, like, because it wasn't part of our deal, right? So he said, just just do it for like a week or two till I find someone else to take over, and then I can go back to answering the phone. So I thought, yeah, this is this is this is sick. Um, I'll just do it for a week or two. I mean, I've done it already. I already know how it works. Do you know what I mean? So I thought, yeah, that I could do it. I went um, Portsmouth. Funny enough, I remember the first time I went Portsmouth. I got stabbed. Yeah. What happened there? Uh, um, I was in someone's house, first time, and um, I was chilling at the drug user's house, and the woman just kept talking about this fella, her, her ex. Do you know what I mean? Her ex fella, have you heard of him? Some black geezer. I think, obviously, I'm first time there, innit? So I'm thinking, no, I haven't heard of him. I don't know him, but all through the night she just kept bringing him up, like dropping little hints, to, like saying he's, he's he's a serious person, and but she kept saying, "No, he's my ex. He won't come round here. Like he does. Like, do you know what I mean? We're not together. I'm just letting you know because he's like you might bump into him in the future, kind of thing." So I weren't really taking it in. Like I weren't really taking her serious, to be honest with you. Being naive and that, uh, I weren't really thinking that. Like, She's probably setting me up at the same time as she's telling me all of this. So what happened was, um, it was like 10 o'clock at night. I went to, I got a phone call. Obviously, when I went to Portsmouth to, to sell the drugs, I don't have the phone on me. Um, someone else takes the phone, because obviously he, he, don't, he doesn't want me 
there with the phone and selling drugs, do you know what I mean? So he went there, the phone rang. Um, he said, I've got to go outside and meet someone where we usually meet. As I've gone outside, um, well, I, haven't even, I didn't even make it outside. I opened the front door and you know the estate lights, they're usually that orange. I don't know why they chose that colour, why the government chose that colour to make estate lights orange, but... <laughs> Yeah, so I've opened the door and the first thing I noticed was an orange light shining off a blade. Like literally, I opened the door and the reflection just shoom. I just saw the blade like, so I quickly tried to shut the door. Um, there was two of them, two black guys. But at the time, I, I didn't, I, I don't know that they're drug users, right? Because I'm just thinking, some other like sort of turf or gang or whatever trying to rob me they heard that i'm here i don't know in it do you know what i mean so i've tried to quickly shut the door they barged in and um tossing literally one of them's scream waving a knife around the knife's about this long like you know like a meat knife do you know what I mean? They both had one each. And, um, yeah, where's the drugs? Where's the money? I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know what you're talking about. It's weird. It's, it's weird, yeah. But in my head, I'm thinking, I'm not taking another loss. <laughs> like, it's so, like, it's fucked, but it's real life. Like, do you know what I mean? In my head, I'm thinking, I am not taking this loss because I, I'm only here for two weeks. I'm not trying, if I take any more losses, like my, my weeks here are gonna get extended and whatnot. So I put up a fight. Like I went, I went. But, but I didn't put up a fight to be like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm the guy. Do you know what I mean? I put up a fight because I didn't want to be in debt. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm fighting. I'm fighting for. I'm fighting. We're fighting now for. The, like, I'm fighting for this, and I did fight for it. They didn't take everything. They took some. I just ended up getting stabbed a few times. I had the knife on my throat. Um, yeah, I thought I was gone. I thought I was gonna die. Do you know what I mean? Um, the child sliced my throat. Luckily, I moved, sliced my chin, um, cut off my fingers. These three fingers were literally like, hanging off because where I tried to throw the knife off my throat and it came back, slipped my chin. It was going at it. Like, it was fighting. I don't know what was keeping me going. Do you know what I mean? I think it was adrenaline or the thought of losing the drug, whatever. Played hand in hand, I guess. But um, I, didn't, I didn't really know where else I'd been stabbed because um, I could only like, feel the one because I was, I was in contact with it. It was direct, do you know what I mean? So I, I knew about that one. And then we're fighting. I could feel myself getting weak like, as we're fighting. And I'm I'm still fighting. Like I'm I'm saying to them, I don't know I don't know what you are talking about. But one of them found like a little bit, literally a, a few little rocks in a different room, and he shouted like, "Yeah, I found it!" And they literally just ran out the house. Um, they ran out the house. I literally crawled to the door, shut the door. Um, these time the lights was off because I was about to leave the house. So like before I leave the house, I switch off all the lights and everything. So as I've helped myself stand up, I've switched on the light and it looked like a bloodbath, like murder scene. There was blood sprayed all over the walls, blood on the floor, hands smudging and blood. You could literally, like the blood was, painting a picture of what just happened. Do you know what I mean? From the hallway to the bedroom, to the toilet, it was literally that, yeah. And I've gone, I've gone, obviously I'm still thinking, 
it's not that bad, do you know what I mean? But I could, I could feel myself like getting weak kind of thing and I could feel myself getting cold and so I've gone into the bathroom with my phone and I've rang the, the person I'm working for and I've, I've said to him, I've just had a madness, um, I'm at the, the woman's house, I've been robbed, I've been stabbed. Um, he's asked me, I'm all right, where have you been stabbed? I said, I don't even know, I've switched on the light in the bathroom and I've looked at my chin and that like, it was a deep gash, like, do you know what I mean? It was open, um, not even realising, I've looked at my hand and these three things are literally like, if it was any deeper, they probably would have been gone, do you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the phone to him, but it's like, I'm talking to him, but it's like, I'm not feeling myself, do you know what I mean? I'm, he's saying to me, are you right, are you right, are you right? I'm saying, yeah, I'm fine, but it's like, I don't know, it's, it's like I was going in and out of the speech. And then I've looked down on my side and I've got a big stab wound on my side. Um, I've got a big scar on my right hand side of my body. And, um, and that's when I started panicking because my top was itchy. I don't know how I didn't realise it before, but my top was itchy soaked in blood. And I remember saying to him, I'm going to call the ambulance, I'm going to call the ambulance, I'm going to die here. Like, and he was actually like, no, don't call the ambulance, don't call anyone. You're going to get in trouble if you do that. So I thought, oh shit. I started running through my head like, my parents can't find out about this. I've just come out of jail, ready. Like, I was in college not long ago. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, if they find out this, like, let alone I've been stabbed, it's crazy. Do you know what I mean? So. I said, what do I do? I remember I said to him, what do I do? And he said, just wait there, we're coming. Do you know what I mean? And it's funny because I'm laying on the floor and I'm ring, I'm like, um, I think they took my phone. I was using a house phone. Yeah, I was using my I was using a house phone. And I'm trying to remember what numbers do I know of like my friends in London. And I remember ringing my friend and I said to him, I remember saying to my friend, like, I'm going to die here. Like, this is it. Like, I remember, I just remember saying, Tom, tell my mum I'm sorry, like, I fucked up, kind of thing. And that's what I can remember. The next thing I, the next thing I remember after that is waking up in some woman's house. <laughs> like, literally waking up in a woman, in a bed, in a bed. Um, bandaged up, my fingers are like <laughs> bandaged up, my side is like, I don't know what they've done to it, but looking at the scar now, it doesn't look like they've done something clean because the scar looks so rough. Um, I remember I opened my eyes and the person I'm working for, he's there, other guys are there with him and it was just this, they were just literally storming up and down the room that like, saying, don't worry, we've got you, we're going to find out he done this to you. We've got you, you've made it, you're alive. And I was just confused, innit? Like, do you know what I mean? I was thirsty, my mouth was dry, like, I was thinking, where am I, like? Um, but in a way, I was happy to see them because I felt like they, they've got my back. Do you know what I mean? They've just drove from London to Portsmouth. Now, that's a, that's a 90 something miles trip, 93 miles, trip from London to Portsmouth. And they came all the way this way to save me. And I, I, I felt like this, this is my family. It's crazy, isn't it? I know. <laughs> but if they, if it weren't for them, I probably wouldn't be here. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's, that's how I thought anyway at the time, but Nonetheless, um, my parents never knew that I got stabbed. I was literally at home, um, like, <laughs> I remember trying to hide my fingers every time. I'm talking, trying to hide my chin. Do you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't take my top off, like, around them and whatnot. 
sometimes I'll be like, oh, why are you walking funny or are you right? Or I just like, no, I'm fine. Like she like you like seeing things. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like, do you know what I mean? But cut a long story short, um 2014, my house got raided. Trident gangs unit kicked in the door. And um Oh yeah, I did. I did stop going up there. I, I, he put me back on the, just answering the phone. Well, um, that's all I was doing, just answering the phone. And then, um, yeah, tried and kicked in my house. To, I was at like twenty. At this, at this, at this stage, um, they came in, armed police, don't move, whatever, whatnot, whatnot. They raided my house and I had drug 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 paraphernalia things there. Do you know what I mean? Um the people I was working for, um, sometimes they'll come there, wrap up their drugs at my house and whatever, and we'll chill and we'll talk about um what I should do or what's going on or whatever. And I had like mixing bowls, um, um Press machines, like I had, there was enough evidence on my house to suggest some sort of packaging of drugs, supply of drugs or something. Do you know what I mean? So when I when I woke up properly and realised I was, I already knew I was going to get in trouble, right? Because I went to prison in young offenders for drugs, and what was in my house was um, drug related things. So I already knew I was going to get in trouble for drugs. But what threw me off was. Um, they said, I'm arresting you for conspiracy to supply a class A drugs. And I said, mm-hmm. And he said, and human trafficking, modern day slavery act. I said, what? <laughs> I said, you got the wrong person. Like, what are you talking about, human trafficking? I said, ain't that like bringing people over to the country in like trucks and illegally and things like that? He was like, he was like yeah, kind of, but now it's, we're targeting drug dealers and that. I said to him, no, you got the wrong person. Like, I haven't I haven't brought anyone into the country, like, or out of the country. And he literally rolled down a scroll of an image of me, put it next to my head, and he said, no, we got the right person. And I was so confused. I remember I was so angry and confused. And I remember saying to the police that, like, um, don't shoot me or something like that, because that, that's the whole the whole hype about Mark Duggan and everything. Um, rest in peace. Happened. Um, what happened next then? What happened next? I went to the police station, Lucian, and they were like, "Oh, no!" I saw I saw my co-defendants there, so there's other co-defendants. I saw them there. And they were like, yeah, you're getting done for human trafficking. Um, and I was so confused. And I went to the interview and they didn't interview, they didn't say nothing about the human trafficking. They didn't mention it one part. My solicitor was confused. Um, they charged me for conspiracy to supply class A drugs. I went to prison that same day, 2014. And I went guilty for conspiracy to supply class A drugs because they didn't bring up the trafficking. In court, um, my sister had done her, her checks and we was told that I'd been NFA'd um, for the human trafficking, no further action. And then I got six years for the drugs. Um, so I remember I've, I've, I'm well into my sentence now, 2017 we're at now. I'm in HMP Brixton and two um, Trident officers came to see me and they said, um, we're charging you for human trafficking. What did they say you? I said, what, the same case from 2014? And they said, yeah, we, we've got um, enough evidence to charge you now. And I said, but well, what's changed? How, why, why didn't you have the evidence before? Because 
it's the same evidence. Do you know what I mean? If you've arrested me for something, you already know what you have. Do you know what I mean? It's not going to take you three years later to charge me for something that you arrested me for already. But um, so I was thinking, what happens now? Because I'm I'm literally like maybe like six six to eight months before my release. Do you know what I mean? So I'm saying to them, what happens now? And they said, um, we'll try to get you remanded, which remanded means that stay in prison um, pending a case. So which would mean that after I finish my six year, I would have to then sit in prison while, they, while I answer for the human trafficking case, right? But my sister was like, this is ridiculous. Like, they can't, they're taking the piss. You know what I mean? Because if, I, if this case got dealt with in 2014, I'd be coming out of a free man, ha however long they gave me. Do you know what I mean? So then um, I was going to court, battling to get bail. Um, the police did not want me to get bail. They were fighting against it. I got a bell in the end, but with like the, the most strictest conditions, like the most strictest conditions. Um, I couldn't do anything at all. I was forced to live at my mum's house again as part of my bell conditions. And then, um, to cut a long story short, I just, I just gave up. Do you know what I mean? Because if, for someone, Getting six year sentence, anyone that's done time in prison, when you're coming to the end of your sentence, you've got plans, do you know what I mean? You're thinking, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna do things differently, um, get a job and whatnot, whatever. Coming out on bail with those restrictions prevented me from doing anything. So it was like, instead of coming home 2017, happy free man, as you like, I felt like I came home for a short break just to go back to prison. Do you know what I mean? So I was extremely demotivated. Um, sleeping on my mom's sofa. Um, didn't do any good for my self-esteem. Do you know what I mean? Um, to the point where I just gave up. Because I'm going to call, I'm going to the police station, signing on twice a week. And I thought, everyone, literally everyone said, the probation, the police, my solicitor, everyone's telling me, prepare to go back to jail. Like, literally, that they're saying, worst case, you're going back to jail for this case. And I was thinking, this is just ridiculous. Like, these people, like, they're just taking the piss. So, yeah, I gave up and I went back to it <laughs> because that's the only thing I knew. Do you know what I mean? From a young boy, so that's the only thing that, that, that I'd done and I felt like it cared for me. Do you know what I mean? Because when I was selling drugs, I had money in my pocket. I was in a good place mentally. Um, well, I thought I was, but do you know what I mean? If I think I am, then I am. Do you know what I mean? Others might say different, but I thought I was in a good place. So I went back to whatever I was doing in a different way or whatever got arrested Scotland with thousands of pounds worth of money, drugs. I got five years, seven months for that. And then I got three years, three years, three and a half years for the trafficking. So the case for the trafficking is that I trafficked someone who was 16 when I was 20 by putting them on a train to Portsmouth for them to sell drugs. The police say it on my behalf, but the person wasn't working on my behalf. They were working on someone above me. Do you know what I mean? Which they accepted in court that there is other people in the chain. Do you know what I mean? But um, I went not guilty for that all the way. I stood in the dock, I gave my evidence, I explained to them um, as best as I can that this charge is not 
is overboard, basically. You guys charging me for someone who has accepted selling drugs. The same way I accepted selling drugs at the age of 15, when I went to Young Offenders, and no one asked me any questions about anything or no one dealt with me any different, it was the exact same way that the 16-year-old person took responsibility, even got charged for selling drugs. They done him for selling the drugs and they done me for having him selling the drugs. So they basically had their cake and ate it twice. Charge with this party as well. um, it was a big case. I can only just speak for myself though. In, in, in my case, it was just me and the person, the one person working below me. No, sorry, bro. In regards to the, the, the human trafficking of the modern day slavery, was there anyone else prior to your, your case that you had been charged with? I was the first person in the UK. My case was a landmark case. It was a trial case, really, to see where they can take it, to see what they can do. Like, do you know what I mean? I mean, for, to the police, it's a good idea. Let's charge the drug dealers for trafficking as well. Give them longer sentences in prison. Um, give them more restrictions in terms of movement. And, and we can be more intrusive in their personal life. So for the police, it was a good idea. But for the average drug dealer, it's like, hold on a minute. I mean, put me in jail for selling drugs, but don't start labelling me a human trafficker because there's real human traffickers out there that is really trafficking humans. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so I feel like the, the, the police have used it, used this law in a way to target low-level drug dealers and use it in a way to get their numbers up on human trafficking because that's, that's what it's going to go down as. The more people they get done for human trafficking through drug dealing, it's going to be like, oh, look, their chief's going to be like, oh, we're, we're doing really well on the human trafficking side of it. We're nailing it. But really, what you guys are just doing is arresting low-level drug dealers and labelling them human traffickers so you guys look good. And it just doesn't make sense. Like, I'm not saying what I was doing was right at all. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is there was no justice when I got given three years at 15. Do you know what I mean? There was no care when I came out of custody at 18. Do you know what I mean? No one cared. No one supported me. Um, there was no system there to support me. So how can the government possibly... I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for anyone else's case or anything like that. I'm speaking for my case. How can the government expect me to understand that a 16-year-old boy selling drugs for me when I'm 20 is wrong when I was doing it much younger and no one flicked the eyelid? Do you know what I mean? And how long did you get all in all for your trafficking and the case? I basically, so I got six years for the conspiracy because it was one case, they just split in two. So I got six years for the drugs alone and I got three and a half years for the trafficking. So what's that? Add it up, nine. And then I got five years, seven months unrelated Scotland case. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've been, I'm 20, I just turned 29 and I've been out of custody for six months. And throughout a random year before 2022, and I'll tell you I was in prison, dating back from 2010. Throw it out, 2012, I was in custody. What, 14 custody, custody. 16 custody, do you know what I mean? And I put my hands up on my mistakes, do you know what I mean? But I won't accept something that I'm not. And the police may change the wording, 
use other people's case and make it look like it's my case for the public. Do you know what I mean? Um, which they done in their response to the Daily Mail. Um, I just want to talk about my case, me as an individual. Do you know what I mean? So the police are very smart in trying to make my case look bigger than what it actually was. Or make me look like I'd done things that I didn't. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm 29 now and I've got a lot, a lot of things I've been through, but I don't even hold any hate. I'm not angry. I'm not, I'm not like against the government, but I do think this law needs to get looked at differently. And I think that um, young people do need support. And I don't think the police just throwing out, oh, we've arrested a person that they were selling. That's not really support. Do you know what I mean? Because what they're really doing to the, 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 young, the young guys that are claiming are victims, right? Like, they're not really doing nothing. They're just arresting the guys that, that they're dealing for, but they're not actually supporting the young people. Do you know what I mean? Because I know a lot of young people right now that the police call victims, they ain't getting no support. They're out here still struggling, still looking for ways to make money. Do you know what I mean? Still looking um, for ways to get out of shit situations. So the word victim, is given to them, but they're not being treated like victims. <laughs> Off the record, they're not. Do you know what I mean? I know that firsthand.